In the Arhangai region of Mongolia, the nearest restaurant can be hundreds of miles away. Today, a team of American scientists has stopped for lunch, but this is no drive through Catching a sheep is the first step. Mongolian barbecues, or whorehogs, have started the same way for thousands of years. This, I mean, I do. Tell me when. That's part of it. Yeah. That's part of the large. Huh? Uh, we have the mesentery fat, which we've wrapped around the liver, and then we're going to cook it on that rock. Oh, this is this is best part. Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely delicious. Very mild. I've had the last time; it was quite strong. That the Irish don't hold the candle to Mongolian blood sausage. Okay, here comes the kidney and the heart. Not bad. Texture is not what the typical American is used to. In Western countries, meat is expected to be very tender, highly processed, and completely packaged. For us, animal products are big business. 29 billion pounds of beef are consumed in the U.S. every year. To put that in perspective, imagine 131 Nimitz-class aircraft carriers or the Great Pyramids of Giza. We wash it down with 6 billion gallons of milk. And yet American farmers and ranchers who produce all of this stuff every year have been reduced to just 3% of the population. This demographic shift in the United States from a rural to urban environment has completely disconnected people from the food they eat, water they drink, and even the air they breathe. To make things even more interesting, this tenuous situation is spreading around the world from developed countries to the grasslands of Mongolia. I think the biggest threat to rangeland is development. People have lost total touch about where their food comes from. Grass-fed, natural, organic, those are all the words that are used. Tough, durable people, but under tremendous strain. With every family ranch that goes out of business, things that you need to know to you know, do this will be gone. The Mongolian steppe spans thousands of miles from Siberia to the Gobi Desert. Much of its 300 million acres remains a pristine example of what scientists call rangeland. Over millions of years, herds of grass-eating animals have co-evolved with rangelands, just like the co-evolution of buffalo on the American Great Plains. Semi-nomadic herders have been raising animals in the same way for thousands of years. This makes Mongolia a window back into time. Dr. Dennis Sheehy has been studying livestock and pasture interactions here for over two decades. This herder a long time ago, and there's some good fish in there. <clears throat> He's the guy that got hit by lightning on his horse, killed his horse. <laughs> Where Joe had the, the act good riding. time? <laughs> no, with Mark Porter. Oh, yeah. Uh, where he tried to ride the yak, and I had to wrestle him down and get him in a headlock. And all the Mongolians are standing around, and I got this cowboy in this headlock, and he's trying to kick my head off. Accidentally, he kicks him with Robin. They're all about three quarters drunk. Robin hauls off and kicks him right to the payback. We sang so while. Yeah. 
Yeah, I grew up on a beef cattle ranch in eastern Oregon. In fact, in some ways, I spent my whole life in eastern Oregon and in Mongolia. And uh, it's funny, over the years, it's, it's not the differences that have really, you know, come to the forefront, it's the similarities. It turns out that these similarities are the result of domestic animals being embedded in cultures worldwide since the beginning of civilization. According to archaeologists, early domestication occurred when human hunters and gatherers became sedentary farmers. Simultaneously, we domesticated wheat, barley, and peas. Reliance on domesticated animals has built empires, supported major advances in technology, and has caused some of our worst diseases. Now, most natural ecosystems reflect interdependence with livestock production. Unlike the pastoralists before them, landowners or ranchers raise livestock for profit. These ranches have replaced herders with fences and trail drives with cattle trucks. Privatization has also opened the door to large companies that move vast numbers of animals through integrated shipping, slaughter, and processing facilities. These examples show a progression from open rangelands and natural systems to a more confined factory model of agriculture. For now, pastoralists and ranchers still provide the majority of animals, and they do it on the open rangelands of the world. These deserts, grasslands, and tundras do more than just grow bigger beef cows. They're part of a very complex natural environment that humans rely on for clean water and clean air. If industrial food production is adopted worldwide, what happens to these ecosystems? Stephanie Larson is a farm advisor in Sonoma County, California, and her job is to understand these systems on a broader level. Range management has changed over the years. When range management was first established, it was to produce better forage for the cattle. Over time, range management has evolved to include a bigger piece of ecology. So we're looking at all the different cycles and how they intertwine with the rangelands. The water cycle, the energy cycle, the nutrient cycle how that all benefits the plants, what's growing above, what's growing below, the health of the soil, and yes, how all of that works into putting grazing animals on that land as well. It now has become a more integral part, taking the grazing animal and putting it with the ecology of the land to improve the rangeland management. Ecology is the story of how most life harnesses the free energy of the sun for survival. This energy takes many forms as it passes between plants, animals, and the environment. Ken Tate is more than just an amateur kite flyer. He is also a rangeland ecologist with the University of California at Davis. A herbivore comes along, consumes that forage. That's also an inefficient process whereas less than 10% of the forage consumed by a herbivore such as a cow is converted to the body mass and thus, say, a steak. Given that this process is so inefficient, why would we raise beef cattle on rangelands? Well, a lot of the Earth's surface is rangeland. It's too dry, too steep, too rocky, and unsuitable to generate some other type of a commodity or, or product for consumption. And so using the cow is an efficient way to harvest the biomass that is generated on that system. At a local restaurant, most people probably aren't thinking about the energy cycle. 
Our packaging and distribution system has used very effective marketing to create a polished product quite different from the living, breathing source. Food comes wrapped or in a box that is long past looking like any kind of animal. Back in Mongolia, Tom Horizon is getting a lesson in direct marketing. The meat goes right from the animal to his stomach with no middlemen. Right there. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. Like that. huh? That's yeah. it. That's it. That's yeah. yeah. exactly where to Just cut through done. that joint. No sauce. It has a little bit of bark on it from the mesenteric fat, which you normally don't get on liver. That's fabulous. A blood sausage wrapped in the intestine. I'm going to have a little salt in this. Oh, yeah. Good. A little, um. There's that universal organ meat flavor. You pick up with liver, heart, and now with kidney, of course. Eating meat is really only one step from being a vegan. As grass grows, it draws nutrients from the soil. Tom's sheep ate grass, and during the digestive process, it was broken down and the nutrients were absorbed. Livestock are useful for more than just food. Grazers are like a lawnmower. They can be a very helpful tool in maintaining a certain habitat, in this case, a lawn. Ecologists like Jamie Marty with the Nature Conservancy and Mel George of UC Davis are studying how livestock in the absence of wild herds maintain California's vernal pools. So you can see what happens when you don't graze this habitat for a number of years, you start to see a lot more grass growing in and not a whole lot of forbs. And what happens with the removal of cattle grazing is the grasses really start to dominate because cattle prefer uh, feeding on grasses over the forbs. So why don't we go check out a pool that's been grazed? So I think historically the grazing pattern prior to cattle being introduced would have been tule elk and pronghorn uh, sort of sweeping through the grassland. So a lot of these plants um, have evolved the ability to tolerate grazing. The protection of these habitats doesn't end with the placement of a conservation easement on the land or protection by a local conservancy. The management of the property is equally critical and as we've seen with the grazing studies, if you remove cattle grazing from these habitats that have been grazed for over a century, the results are not, uh, are not positive for native biodiversity. In a landscape free of barriers, wild herbivores are usually still around. They follow the best forage in patterns that have developed over thousands of years. Mongolia is one of the few remaining places where wildlife such as the Hulan still make their decisions this way. In the Hulan's case, they do have a unique ability to dig down to water. That gives them a competitive advantage over livestock. What we have here is a Probably in the, in the recent couple of weeks, there's been a thunderstorm happened here, some sort of precipitation event, and then you get this quick regrowth of, of uh, forage. And for the Hulon, they have the ability to seek out these green patches, and often they'll travel hundreds or even thousands of kilometers in terms of seeking out these forage green patches. In Mongolia, the cattle and sheep have been domesticated, but they're herded in much the same way. This is the foundation of the semi-nomadic system that has been in place for thousands of years. One of the real opportunities with rangeland, especially in the developing world, is to view rangeland as wildlife habitat, but also a working landscape. Rangeland, and grazing are not really in, as intensive as crop production, for example, or as 
uh, subdivisions. And so their impact on the environment are lower. And so that the rangelands that have been grazed for 100 or 200 years by domestic livestock still have a lot of the attributes uh, that they may have had prior to the arrival of European man in the United States. Living off the land is part of the past and has always been romanticized. In recent years, advocates of long-term sustainability have brought these ideas back to the mainstream. However, there is a downside to using only what can be renewed. Nature doesn't always provide enough. In Mongolia, the winter wind blowing down from Siberia is a harsh reality. This makes the capital city, Ulaanbaatar, the coldest capital in the world. It can reach polar temperatures. The Mongolian word zud describes a harsh drought in the summer, followed by an especially cruel winter. Between 1999 and 2003, 8.5 million livestock starved to death in a series of winter storms. This led to 10,000 herding families without livestock or a livelihood. In the past, the government would feed animals in emergency areas, but that service hasn't been available for decades. This is sustainability. No one rides to the rescue. Those two consecutive bad years, first year we didn't have almost no loss almost no loss but next year when we were we were hit bad we lost you know, half of our cattle Puador and his wife Chimgi are two herders in the Arhangai region of Mongolia who not only survived the latest zud they've also adapted to the new dangers and rewards of a free market economy they were milking yak. <laughs> yeah, yak milk fat content is very high. Arhanga Amak, especially Ishtemir, is very famous with its milk products all over the Mongolia. And uh, it has been tested for centuries and centuries. What we do every day is well, we get up in the morning, have a tea, go out and milk, milk the cows. Boy, boy goes on the pasture to look after sheep. We would graze sheep and goats in the same place for three days. In March, small animals start, you know, giving birth. Starting around this time, we start selling animals for meat. A thousand miles to the south, herders live in much the same way, but life is even harder. What they're doing is moving all the herders. They're, they're out in the middle of nowhere. They're out in the middle of the Gobi Desert. It's just like the herder we were just been talking to, he says, we're, we're like wild men down here in the Gobi. We're having to uh, survive on our own. If, if we all died, nobody would even know about it, and probably nobody would really care. As a Western market economy sweeps across Mongolia, herders are leaving more often for the city. During the Soviet era, Russia encouraged a similar migration. In 1989, the Mongolian economy collapsed. Mass starvation was avoided because the remaining herders in the countryside took in their urban relatives. Now, as globalization falters, the cycle is happening again. It always happens, it's going to happen again here, but 
the next time it happens, if the urban poor want to move back to the country, it's going to be a lot more difficult for that herding lifestyle to absorb the next group of people that move back there. In the West, a disruption of our food supply would be even more difficult. For every food producer in the United States, there would be 50 urban relatives looking for handouts. Even ranchers who pride themselves on their autonomy are still a few steps from food independence. The infrastructure surrounding beef has developed to the point where even they purchase most of the food they eat and sell almost all of the beef they produce. Even so, ranching tends to be more independent than our other food industries. Beef production in the United States is complex. The consumer thinks that beef comes from a, a package in the supermarket uh, that the supermarket gets from a large corporation. Uh, and, and that's partly true. But the truth is that beef is produced by family farms all over the United States on range and pasture land. And then those calves may go into a feedlot and enter the corporate uh, production process. A lot of the western rangelands in the United States are family owned and they've been passed on for generation to generation. It becomes part of the family. They develop a relationship with their landscape. It's true that these families are supplying a needed product, but like the Mongolians, they sometimes pause just to admire the landscape. Roping may be a rodeo sport, but it still maintains its roots in the spring branding of calves. For many ranch families, branding has become a traditional event. One of the best ropers this year was Kerry Hermans. Cows have sounds that they make and the smell that they <laughs> smell like, and you know, I could see my husband talking with our neighbor, and. I was, it was just a really nice, kind of almost peaceful scene to be a part of. She's got a little graze, graze on the nose, by a little calf. And then you vaccinate them so that they hopefully don't get certain diseases that calves are prone to get. And, um, and then you castrate the bull calves so that they're steers, because you don't want a bunch of bull calves in your herd. I mean, branding is hopefully something that, you know, you look forward to and you see your neighbors and you have a good time and hopefully it's a nice, warm, sunny day like today and it's a fun, a fun event that people look forward to. Well, most ranchers, you know, if they're, <laughs> if they're any good, know their animals by just looking at them. You know, they can tell if they're an old or young or sick or healthy or... You know, they may not have a name for each animal, but they, they, you know your animals. We'll start in January. So you're just feeding the cows hay, and then they, and they calve through the middle of April. And then we go to our Forest Service allotment, which is a higher elevation. And while they're gone, we grow hay in the fields that they live in all winter. Then we gather them in the fall, like around September, and sell the calves. Then we start feeding the cows the hay, usually around December 1st, that we grew all summer, and start the whole cycle again. These family ranches and farms may have struck a balance between the land they steward and the food they produce, but they haven't found a way to survive in the current era of regulation. Costs continue to increase while prices stay flat and the current economic situation offers little promise. Then now there's been a leveling off again and it's almost like the, the problem that happens on that is that there needs to be another jump to account for increased fuel cost and also increased regulatory costs uh, and just increased costs of production. Roger Ingram is a farm advisor for Placer County in California. The increasing costs and regulations worry him 
But he's taken note of an even larger problem looming on the horizon. Cattle producers, livestock producers are uh, 65 years of age or older. I know that this year I went to two funerals. Well, actually there were three funerals that almost were like in August, about a week apart. The kids who were raised in it have not come back and have gone on to, you know, urban areas and cities and so a lot of you know the ranching farming population is an older population and so I guess you know when they become unable to farm you know and they'll probably end up selling it as as a retirement because no one is left to take it over. Well, I, I hope to teach my kids from, you know, being raised in a ranching lifestyle, you know, the value of hard work and, you know, be tough individuals that don't give up when the first thing goes wrong. The best part about it is that it's a business that you can do with your kids. Ranchers are often asked, why not charge more? The advent of, of large corporations' uh, involvement in beef production or lamb production is really rather recent in the stream of human history. These corporations got started where the profit could be maximized, somewhere in that gray area between the producer and the supermarket. This prime real estate is called processing and generates $100 billion every year. Across the United States, there used to be many packing and inspection plants. In the 1980s, consolidation, often favored by modern inspection regulations, allowed only a handful of corporations to control the entire processing industry, from feedlots to supermarkets. Since then, family ranches have struggled with the low prices that are set for them. The more units that you can run through there, I mean, then, then the easier it is to make that whole profitability. Danger on what's happened uh, on that other end is when you have very few entities controlling such a large part of the market, then what sort of influence are they playing on uh, pricing? And Corporate beef production has a complicated history. But the worldwide trend is for these companies to continue to expand. In China, the new breed are called dragon heads. In the U.S., they're referred to as vertically integrated companies. When a corporation reaches this level, it means it controls all parts of the process, even the job of raising the animals. This is how chicken, pork, and most crops are produced. With beef, Production still takes place on family ranches up until the animal is finished. Ranching is the last holdout. If enough go under, then cows will never know anything except a feedlot. You have the consolidation in the, in, with the packers, but now what happens if somebody from outside the U.S. wants to come in and own one of those companies, like Swift, for example, uh, what would be the implications there? That maybe puts things that are a little bit more at risk. The second great risk is just now hitting the radar. Remember the energy cycle, sun, grass, meat. With industrialized beef production, there is one more item, oil. This is how our feedlots are growing beef. Oil is made into fertilizer and diesel for tractors, which together can grow a lot of corn. Oil powers trucks, which haul the corn and cows across the country to feedlots. Later, the cows are trucked to the slaughterhouse and grocery store. That's a system that's been in place since about the late 40s and the, the 50s, but that's a system that's perpetuated on cheap oil. How much of this goes into the production of one of these? I don't know, perhaps about... Now this is the texture we're used to. Good. Now 
was good. Cut. In effect, the price of food is tied to the price of fossil fuels, and as oil runs out, prices will climb right up into the sky, which ironically is where all the greenhouse gases are being pumped. Fossil fuels are causing smog in cities and contributing to climate change. Unfortunately, research is showing that the industrial animal, with its unusual diet, is also contributing large quantities of greenhouse gases. The United Nations speculated that volatile organic compounds, otherwise known as animal flatulence, may be as influential as automobile emissions. The best way to actually measure the gases is in biobubbles like these. Dr. Frank Mitloner, an air quality specialist, is the first researcher to be interested in animal flatulence since 1938. So fresh waste is the number one source followed by fermented feed for smoke forming gases on dairies. While the animals themselves through enteric fermentation produce greenhouse gases and here mainly methane. So uh, sometimes my students and I joke about uh, putting cars into three of the four bubbles and uh, having cows in number four and, and run them head, head to head and uh, figure out if it's true that, that cows indeed rival cars as smoke producers. And uh, but we'll, we'll find out. Ed De Peters, also of UC Davis, is studying the other end of the cow. He wants to understand what happens when livestock diets are altered. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look inside of the rumen of Edwina. So we always put gloves on, so we use some latex gloves. And if you could smell through the camera, what you would smell is you would smell all of the volatile fatty acids that are being produced. So the acetic, the propionic, and the butyric acid that are being produced by the anaerobic fermentation have a very pungent smell. I mean, they're volatile fatty acids, meaning they're volatile, and you can smell them. And if we look, we can see alfalfa hay, the fiber component, and that's what makes Edwina's rumen unique. You can see all the rumen fluid that contains the millions and millions of anaerobic bacteria. And in the current environment, when we're talking about greenhouse gases, we can study methane, we can study hydrogen sulfide. So we can look at the differences if we were to add some kind of rumen modifier. We talk about many different compounds that may change the microbial population. How does that rumen modifier change the microbial population, change fiber digestion, and change the amount of methane that's produced by Edwina? Modern science may help problems like air quality, but in a few decades, there will be 9.5 billion people to feed. Industrial food production and all its issues will scale production to match. As if the vulnerability of food production the increased dependency on fossil fuels and the loss of healthy food weren't enough. The greatest cost is to the ecosystem. As family ranches go under, what happens to their land? Because we're not making money in ranching right now, pretty hard to make the payment on this piece of property, but there's a small corner of it that we could hopefully sell off and we wouldn't want to sell it off if we didn't have to. But um, to try to stay in this business a little longer, I mean, it seems a logical thing to do. It's not really being used. It's just a small, you know, little five-acre piece. And Over the last uh, uh, few decades, we've seen rampant uh, subdivision of land that was formerly used for grazing. Uh, and this has uh, resulted in the destruction of wildlife habitat. And then over the course of the last five years in particular, there's been a lot of interest in property and homes for second homes. This pressure is being noticed by more than just Lance Bailey at the Planning Commission. Across the valley from Kerry Herman's is the Wolf Ranch. They're one of the larger landowners in the area and Woody Wolf knows that this pressure is very real. Land values have probably uh, tripled to quadrupled, and that's at the, the smaller parcel. And this trend continues. 
that's how we get five acre lots, you know, bare lots costing $200,000. Now for agricultural use, you know, five acres is not worth anywhere near that, the best farmland in the entire county. These land prices are being set by the majority. People moving from high land values to areas of relatively low land values. This has consequences for agricultural production. And I've, I've seen it quite a few times. They'll come in and they have no experience, um, but they'll try to run it. And they'll create themselves a, a, a negative cash flow situation. And then, then they'll either choose to rent it out, change how they do it, or just resell it. And when they do resell it, usually they mark it up 10 to 30 percent and sooner or later somebody comes and buys it and the same thing happens over again. <laughs> the current real estate model favors fragmentation of the landscape. When a large contiguous ranch goes on the market, it tends to be broken into smaller and smaller properties. as a once functioning ecosystems becomes fragmented into small non-functioning pieces. We don't capture water the way we used to. In addition, we see a whole change in the vegetation that's out there. So what we see is that the landscape completely changes. This landscape destruction is one of the major factors leading to widespread extinction of species. E.O. Wilson, a prominent ecologist, estimates that tens of thousands are going extinct every year. Human destruction of the biosphere is being compared to the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. Some estimates predict that 50% of the Earth's species will be gone in this century. If this dramatic and overwhelming mass extinction continues, the entire fabric of life on Earth, including humans, could collapse. So, you know, if we allow all of the rangelands of the West to be broken up into small pieces uh, so that everybody can have their single family home on five acres, uh, we're going to destroy the ecological as well as managerial characteristics that allows us to use those for ranches and allows them to support uh, the wildlife habitat uh, and the wildlife that we expect to find there today. As globalization spreads, even remote countries like Mongolia have committed themselves to building a larger, more modern economy. Rangelands worldwide must find a way to produce profit in their current form, or they face development for other uses. If we're going to be competitive still, we have to have access to food goods. We either have to put up the hay ourselves, or we buy it somewhere else and bring it in and sell it slow. All land in Mongolia is still owned by the public. The herders operate in a semi-nomadic herding system based on traditional camps that have passed down in their families. In this meeting, local herders are discussing the approaching change. The government is in the process of privatizing land ownership. Consultants like Dr. Sheehy have seen this before. What you get is, not only for the herders or people who want to grow veggies, you know, which is reasonable, you know, you, you get, you open it up to outsiders. You open it up to Chinese, you open it up to Koreans. Uh, anybody can come in here and lease large tracts of land for agriculture purposes. This is a very real possibility, since the enormous Chinese economy borders Mongolia on the south. Presently, the Chinese are mainly interested in mining and resource extraction. But once land is privatized, the floodgates for development will open. The possibility of too much development must seem ridiculous to Mongolians. There is so much freedom and unclaimed space.
It is a country three times the size of Texas, with only two million people. Travelers can spend days without seeing anyone. One can appreciate the past and think about the future. landscape such as this that is 0.90% in the public domain and within the state of Mongolia, uh, what they decide to do with this incredible landscape. Any luck? Yeah. Ah. Go Let's go, I think My driver. Let's go. He may never, he may have no awareness of what's coming about. But he does like my flies. No down, I think upstream. Downstream. Yep. No good? No. Downstream. Half a world away, industrialization has already taken place along the central coast of California. Now the ranchers, restaurants, and grocers are working to move in the opposite direction. I think that they're just thinking big plant again, rather than small plant, you know, we just don't need it. Deb Garrison has spearheaded an innovative approach. She calls it the Coast Grown Cooperative. It provides a glimpse into the future and the past. Um, in the 50s, we still had a grocery store that would go up to the ranches and purchase um, meat from those ranches. They were able to have their own little butcher shops and they cut their meat right there and we purchased it from them. Uh, regulations be started to come into play at that point. With good reason. Industrial feedlots and slaughterhouses are breeding grounds for diseases and pollution. Deb's vision has found a way to comply with this thicket of regulations and still meet a growing demand for responsible local beef. Her co-op will be the first of its kind in California. Oh, you found it! <laughs> in this day and age now, I think we're coming full circle. Um, people are aware now of the um, the costs that were hidden with large industrial type of uh, food production, and they're asking questions. And because they're asking questions, it's causing a demand for us to scale down again and to come full circle back to that grocery store that we used to go to in the 1950s. The first step is to recruit local ranchers. In theory, this should be easy. Not only will members be able to set their own price, they should expect to make 15 to 20 percent more money, and they won't have to ship their cattle for USDA inspection. That translates to more money for less work. And we have all these cattle and all these ranches around, well, slowly they're diminishing, but to keep all these ranches alive, to keep them profitable, um, why not have, why not finish it here? For the Poet family, Elizabeth is the sixth generation to raise livestock. The Rancho San Julian has been in their able hands for more than 150 years. Today, it's shrouded in marine fog rolling in across the coastal hills. As the fog lifts, it reveals pastures and cattle against a natural backdrop that more and more consumers are beginning to appreciate. what I'm trying to do is I would like the cattle to be born and raised and finished on the ranch and that's um, what I think is best for the animal I think it's best for the beef and and best in the long run for the um, for the environment returning to the old ways solves many of our problems but government regulations have made that difficult to achieve the ranchers in the, um, our area, um, here on the Central Coast and all over California, um, cannot sell portion cuts of their animals to, let's say, um, any consumer if it's not USDA inspected. You have to travel miles, miles and miles to bring your animals 
to a USDA approved site if you want to sell beef? Most cities or towns do not have USDA slaughterhouses anymore because our industrial um, food processing has taken those all away. They've shut them down. So that's the problem. Deb's solution is to bring the inspector and the slaughterhouse to the ranch. After a bit of engineering, she's put the whole show on wheels. Behind us you'll see our mobile harvest unit that we acquired back in 2003. Um, it's taken us quite a while to get through all of the compliance issues that we need to to be able to use this unit for USDA Food Safety Inspection Service. Yeah, we, got it. we need a big foam pad or something there. USDA and the Food Safety Inspection Service have just in the past few years really started to concentrate on smaller plants. So they've made it a little bit easier for the smaller plant to comply, although you can get a mobile harvest unit in your area, but it doesn't mean that you can s sell portion cut USDA inspected meat. You still have to have that plant that you're connected to in order to be able to do the cut and wrap piece of it. So it's a, it's a two-step, two-phase situation to make it work. They're all off prime ribs. Okay. Jim Fogel is phase two. He's the manager of the Paso Meat Company. Like the mobile harvesting unit, this small town facility is USDA compliant, but it feels like something from a history book. And, I mean, that's what we try to do here is uh, give them what they want. Instead of going to a like, local grocery store and getting what they have, we want to give them what they want. No parsley. Boy, that's good. It's got 13 spices in it. You might be in business. Cool. One, two, three, four. That's perfect. There's a paper trail that's 100 miles long, whether it's one cattle or 100. You know, uh, everything. I mean, everything from time, temperature, name. It's all recorded from beginning to end. Uh, and it's it's not any different here than it is in a big slaughter plant. It's just, I, I think, basically, we just got a little bit more control in what we're doing. Yeah, this here is a part of the facility that was built uh, especially for the MHU, the Mobile Harvesting Unit, and that helps us preserve our USDA integrity of the unit by encapsulating it in the building. Right there, we got 280 pounds right there, and from here, the animal's tagged, name, weight, date, floor controls on the sinks, those were added. Okay, these are restricted ingredients. This is just a sheet and another piece of paperwork there. Now in the freezer here, this here's an addition that was put in for the USDA compliance. This is just a holding area. If they choose to quarantine an animal and they need to freeze it, we put it in this area. They slap their lock on it and it's unable to be messed with or until they open it up, until they let us. We've got a man on site at one ranch, okay? If there's a problem with that animal, that problem is solved, contained right there, right at that time. It, it never comes in. This restaurant in Santa Rosa, California has found that buying local grass-fed beef actually brings in more business. Uh, you need to uh, use clarified butter because there's less fat in the grass-fed beef. Season it properly and medium, medium to high heat, not very high heat. The benefits of being local is the fact that the animals are less stressed because they are here. People drive by and actually see the pastures and can put a face on the farmer and producer. Customers are actually asking for the product now. People are happy to, to pay the extra money for these products. Uh, then they know that their product is safe. This farmer's market sells healthy grass-fed meat, which means no fattening with grain. There are other labels. Organic beef means no hormones for the cows and no fertilizers for the grass. Natural doesn't affect how beef is grown, but refers to flavor additives and other processing. Right now, big companies are watching with interest as these markets grow. Say the model finally gets figured out on how to do that efficiently, and so then once that's figured out, then a bigger company would just come along and just sort of just take that model, and because they could do it on a larger scale, you know, would just wipe out the, the little guy. And when that happens, 
it's right back to business as usual. The only way to know for sure where the meat came from is to buy it directly from the local producer. Local really kind of points people out and you can't sit. If you're local, you're local. If you're not, you're not. People want to put a face with the products that they're consuming. People want to know where their meat is coming from. They want to know that the animals were raised in this beautiful type of environment, on the rangelands, not in feedlots, and for the most part, raised mostly on grass. Ecologists agree that life on Earth is being rapidly depleted by the current population of 6.7 billion humans. It's estimated that in a little over two decades, the population will have soared to 9 billion people. It presents an interesting dilemma. The only way to feed this many people is with industrial agriculture systems. Yet this production is helping to destroy the natural ecosystems regulating our planet. How much of a landmass do we have here in the U.S. to continue to try and meet that demand? I don't think it can possibly continue to go that way. I think we're at a point now where we have to come back full circle. There's, there's, there's nowhere else to go but backwards at this point. There's a problem with that now because so many people live in the city and don't grow their own food that the few people that are left on the land are faced with supporting you know, huge amounts of people, whereas in the past, a lot of people grew their own food, or at least their own vegetables. But the bottom line is that the space on this earth is finite. At some point in time, there has to be a huge reduction in population. Whether humans can tackle this task or leave it to nature, a much lower human population is in the near future. A hundred years from now, our descendants will still have an interest in livestock production. Family ranches and pastoral herding harbor much of the knowledge they'll need. For now, it is up to us to preserve these examples. Almost everyone is being pretty vulnerable right now, you know, um, but I think that if you are wanting the safe way to go, yeah, I think smaller is better. Buy local as much as possible, and if you don't know how to buy local, try and figure out where farmers markets are and start going to there. Maybe there's a meat buying club in your area that you can be buying meat. And as long as we have that other choice, these family farms and ranches uh, can stay in business and produce a product near your home. You're going to eat meat that's responsible. You're going to eat meat that's going to be tasting good. You're going to be eating meat that is helping someone in your community. My life depends on pasture, so I would preserve the pasture. This is my passion. This is what I love to do, and I love this ranch, and I was born and raised on this ranch. You really feel like you're part of something that's bigger than yourself. And, it, and there's a lot about ranching that you know, makes you want to get up every day and, and be part of that.